So we're going to look at multiple comparison tests and statistical power, as the slide says. I do apologise if my voice begins to fade. I've had a sore throat for the past week and not felt like I was coming down with a cold, but I, I braved the elements to come in today just to talk about this exciting subject because it just gets me up in the morning. Um, and I'm also paid to do that. So just quickly I want to recap a little bit of last week and hopefully then uh, blend that into today's subject. So if you remember, I've emphasized quite a lot the importance of having a research question ahead of time. So uh, the reason we do some research is to answer a question, and then we often formalize that question in terms of hypotheses. And they are generally very simple questions of, is there a difference or or not between two things. And then so last week we looked at this whole concept of uh, hypothesis testing with the null hypothesis that there is no difference between two groups. And the two groups uh, that we looked at um, were in this example, stormtroopers and clone troopers from the Star Wars episodes. And the thing that we were measuring was height. So we had this null hypothesis that there was no height difference between two groups. I will once again emphasize that the reason for using a fairly abstract idea like this is that regardless of uh, your area of scientific investigation, the concepts are largely transferable between fields. A height is a measurement that we are generally all familiar with. Stormtroopers and clone troopers less so, but that should alert you to the fact that the labels that we use to categorize two groups are largely irrelevant until we get to our discussion. Because of course in discussion it's that context of the categories that we are comparing um, that they then become important. But prior to that, when we simply are doing the, um, the analyses, the labels are largely irrelevant and certainly in these examples they are. But I do appreciate that this sometimes causes uh, some concern. And last week I tried to address this with the concept of two different types of dentist. But evidently this um, did not satisfy everybody. Uh, and, and I do take on board um, feedback and, and try to address this. So. Hence, you will see that you have been handed out a research paper from the Journal of Dental Research, May 2014. I apologize, it's not from this month, but that's pretty current research from a dentally relevant journal. So I hope at least some of you will feel that uh, there is an example there that um, is dentally relevant. We'll get onto that in a minute. And you'll see, hopefully, what, how, what I hope to demonstrate through the activities of today are that uh, some of the things we do in an abstract way using arbitrary labels are directly transferable to understanding and analyzing the results in a current research paper. So the paper that you have uh, is entitled Water Aging Reverses Residual Stresses in Hydrophilic Dental Composites. Some of you may go, yay, that's exactly the area that I'm interested in. Some of you will still be saying this is entirely irrelevant to me. Um, 
and therein we have uh, a problem that we all have different research interests. And in however, it is necessarily uh, dental research. And we can look through, and it has these basic components that I've spoken about previously. So it has um, a, an abstract which just summarizes the, the, the main reason for doing the research and the main findings. And it has an introduction, which, I haven't, which I've captured the beginning of it here. So it sets some background, some context. Uh, feel free to read that. Um, so you can understand why they feel that this piece of research is important. And then at the end of the introduction, they have this statement, the purpose of this study was to, and then they explain exactly what the purpose of their study is. So you see, these are things that I've been banging on about in terms of research structure aren't entirely irrelevant. This is what we see when we read someone else's paper, and therefore it's what is expected when we report our own research. So here they're looking at the hydrophilicity of dental composite materials. And so once they've said this is what we're going to do, then they outline in the materials and methods section how they're going to do this. And you'll see um, a materials and methods section. And I've selected one part of that because we're not going to look at um, a whole paper. And in fact, I'm not going to work through this paper as such. But if we look, if, if you read this section, and you, you should expect to be presented with something that's not necessarily in your research field or your field of expertise, and you should expect to have to determine from that what the important information is and which information you can largely discard. So if you read this section here, you'll see various things. You'll see uh, manufacturers' names, some things like protocol in, in terms of time that uh, a light curing composite was cured for, and how that was done. And then you'll see that uh, a certain volume of composite, which has been denoted V, was, uh, was created. But then we get on to the things that were actually measured. What was measured? Mass, M. And so they put a couple of equations there to explain their uh, measured parameters are water sorption, WSP and sol solubility WSL. But actually, if the volume is the same, they've essentially measured a change in the weight or the mass um, of two materials. So actually, what we did last week, we were measuring height. But of course, you were given um, uh, as an activity for doing during the week. Uh, am I hearing strange sounds? Is that just me? <laughs> um, the, so this activity was to go on from last week and compare the weight of two groups. Well, hang about, this research paper from the Journal of Dental Research, well, they're just measuring the weight of things. So actually, what we learn here is directly applied. Um, and I didn't have to look hard to find that paper either. So don't get panicky about the, uh, the fact we're measuring clone troopers and stormtroopers. They could be t the, uh, the mass or the weight of two dental composite materials. So if we look back um, here, what they also then state in their analysis is that the water sorption and solubility of each composite were analyzed with one-way analysis of variance and two key multiple comparison tests, alpha is less than 0.05. Does someone want to tell me what that means? 
because I don't know. Someone? Yes. So I'm going to step up to the plate and tell us what, how these researchers um, analysed the weight of their um, composite specimens. Ah, oh, well, that's a shame. Fortunately, I do know what they've done, and in fact, it is, you may surprise you the subject of today's session. So, they use this thing called an analysis of variance and a two-key multiple comparison test. Now, the, the key here is that term multiple comparison. So, previously, we've been looking at two groups and just comparing two groups. But in this research, they've got more than two groups. They've actually got, um, perhaps it says, I don't know if I put it in here, uh, they've got multiple uh, dental materials. So let's have a, I don't know if it says on this page how many. But anyway, they've got multiple dental materials and they want to copy them. So this actually gives us a, um, a problem when we think of what we did last week, because we could have thought, well, last week we were measuring two types of dental material and comparing them to see if they were any different. This week, we've got multiple. How do you do that? How do you deal with this um, comparison? Well, these researchers have told us. There's this thing called analysis of variance, ANOVA, and Tukey's multiple comparison test. And when they say alpha is less than 0 0.05, anybody remind us what that might mean? Come on, it's 10 to 10. Brain should be kicking in now. Oh, I've got a hand. That, the question was, is that a p-value? It's the threshold that we're going to compare our p-value to. Do you remember we have this threshold at, at below which we say we have a statistically significant result? So here they've stated that alpha, which is their threshold value, must, um, is less than 0 0.05. So they're going to say, well, if I get a p-value less than 0 0.05, less than 5%, then that's a statistically significant result. So that, they've just told us in their materials and methods that's what they're comparing against. And that's a pretty standard value. The alpha value is the value chosen by the researcher, and your p-value is compared to the alpha value. So you choose alpha equals 0 0.05, or, and you're going to say, if I get a p-value less than that, then I'm going to say this is statistically significant. What does statistically significant mean? What do you do if you get a statistically significant result? Sorry? I think you said it the first time, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's the, it's the probability of um, finding no difference. So the probability of finding a difference between results occurring by chance when there is, isn't really a difference. So what we do is we say we're going to reject the null hypothesis. We're going to say there is a difference. So they're going to say, there are differences between these composite materials. Um, if I get p-values from these tests that are less than 0 0.05, that's what that tell, tells us. And they present some results to us. So I've put the results up, and you can see this in the paper in front of you. Um, and you can download this paper also from the, the QM Plus site if you, if you wish. The, uh, they, set, they now have their sorption values and solubility values. Um, these values here. So those are the, the results that they measured. They've tabulated them. In fact, those are the means. So their mean measurements. And then actually, if you read the footnote, it tells us that they've put a superscript 
to group these together to tell us which ones group which ones are no different from each other and which ones are different statistically and then there's some um statement of results just here so they've, they've told us what what their results show so basically they've described the important features of that table and this is what we should know how to do uh, and we should understand so um the key the key thing that they've noted here is that um sc2 which is just the label the name of that particular material had a greater water absorption than any of the other composites that's one of their important results that they want to alert us to and that you can see that in table two that's the sc2 down here and its value is 37.37 which is much greater than all of the others uh, then we say the two conventional composites exhd and stph had the least water absorption so it just told us that those are the smallest values those are the ones at the top of the page or the top of the table so as we have done when we've been going through our results we state what we see this is what these authors have done they said okay this is the table now i'm going to state what i see and they're just pointing out some key point uh, key aspects of this table that they feel they need to alert us to so there's lots of information but these are the key things that they want us to know um sc2 and cal light cured showed the highest solubility there were no differences among the other materials so that statement of no differences presumably is based on their um, statistical significance of their analyses using the ANOVA and Tukey test so it would probably be helpful to actually know what these things are and what they do and when we use them and because uh, I suspect there may be one or two people who didn't go away and um, try comparing the weights of stormtroopers or dentists um, and because I'm stubborn and like Star Wars uh, there may be not however many t materials are in the in the table so that table what does it say it says uh, means in a co so the means so those are the mean values of the um, obtained for different dental materials and there's one two three four five six seven eight nine there we go has anyone found a pair of glasses So because the research paper is on the subject of weight, we're going to continue with the subject of weight. In my fictitious example of clone troopers and st stormtroopers, feel free to, sub um, to uh, substitute for those orthodontic uh, dentists and restorative dentists or the ma dental materials of your choice. The label, as I said before, is largely irrelevant. The thing that we're measuring here is almost irrelevant as well except when we come to discuss the context um, of our results so we have this uh, burning research question is there a weight difference between clone troopers and stormtroopers and so we need to design an experiment to test the null hypothesis which is there is no difference between there is no difference between the weight of clone troopers and stormtroopers. How many groups have I got? 
So what kind of uh, method might I employ to answer this null hypothesis? I heard it over here. T-test. So this is what we did last week with height, and I thought I'd bring it into weight this week, and we'll do it. So I just want to do this quickly to just recap a bit of exercise, um, sort of exercise the mind or something we did last week before we launch into um, extending this to multiple comparisons. So we have two groups. which I've called stormtroopers and clone troopers. And we're saying that null hypothesis that they have is that they have the same weight. We're going to test it using a um, independent samples t-test, because we're assuming these samples are independent. If we haven't taken one group of things and made a change to it. We have two independent groups. Um, so my proposed way of uh, doing this as part of the Joint Empire Detection Initiative is to weigh a random sample from each group. I'm going to choose 1%, test that null hypothesis that we've just stated, and the way we're going to test it is using independent samples t-test. And the analysis is going to be carried out using SPSS. These should look familiar in that the very similar to the format written in that research paper where they said in, in their under materials and methods they stated the statistical techniques used and they stated very clearly the same kind of information. This is how we did it, this is what we're going to do um, and this is how we're going to analyze it. So okay, I've written it as bullet points in a, a dissertation or a, um, a paper we write that as a, in sentence, as a sentence or in sentences. So, in which case, oh, we haven't got any results yet, which means we have to launch SPSS, which I know everyone did as soon as they sat down at their computers. And uh, we're going to go to the QM Plus website, and I've uploaded a new data file. Um, so if you go down to the QM Plus site. If you need to find the course, you can search for it here as DIN7002. That's DIN7002. Obviously, I expect most of you have booked, bookmarked it as one of your favourites. Um, if you go down to statistics data, it's slightly hidden. So this is all last year's data that you see here. You have to click on the title statistics data to get into the section. And if you click on that title, it will take you to a list of um, data files. And at the bottom of that, you'll see this one called multiple comparison data. So just to recap that, if you get to the QM Plus page, scroll down to statistics data. So, that's the page, scroll down, statistics data, click on the title. And we're going to go down and we're going to find multiple comparison data. And when we click on that, that will open an SPSS file. And when it opens, it should look something like that. Um, hands up if you've managed to get this far. So I get an indication of. Okay, if you aren't able to to uh, get this far for some reason. Uh, feel free to double up with someone who's got the file on their screen or kick back, relax, and watch the show. It's up to you. I think um, it's slightly less dull, slightly less dull. Um, I don't know if it's statistically significant, but slightly less dull if you actually do it and hopefully more useful. So we have this file. 
and it's similar to the one that we had last week. Let's just rem remind ourselves, if you look under the variable view, so at the bottom you have data view and variable view. No, that's okay, if you haven't managed to open it, like I say, just double up with someone who's got it on their screen. You're allowed to work together. It's, uh, we don't have to work in isolation. You're allowed, pardon? Yeah. Unless, that's, unless you've opened up the lecture slides, which also have the same title. You need to go, for those of you who haven't managed to open it, I'll just uh, recap briefly how to get there. So, you get the main website, and then if you scroll down, you'll see a section called Statistics Data. So, you, the first section is stat Statistics Clinic, Timetable, Lectures, Ethics, Lectures Research, Lectures Statistics, Statistics Data. Click on the title, the heading, Statistics Data. So, it's, these are all the files we've used previously. If you click on the heading statistics data and then scroll down the page once again, you'll see magically a new option has appeared that's called multiple comparison data. And it explains the data here as well. And you click on that and it will open up or hopefully download and possibly open up in SPSS. So, we're now in variable view, or I'm in variable view, so you've got the data up like this, you probably opens up in data view, where you can see the names of the variables across the top, we have ID, rank, weight, type, and we have variable view, where we can look at those variables again here, and we get to define um, information about each of those. I've done that, and you see that there's a human readable label here. So, let's go to data view. And you should have that page up. So, in my slide, I said we're going to compare 1% of all of the... Um, so, I'm going to randomly uh, sample 1% of all of these. And we're going to compare um, the weight of stormtroopers versus clone troopers. And of course, because it's still fresh in your memory uh, from last week and all the practice that's been going on throughout the week and the watching of the video lectures over and over, that you've rushed ahead and already done um, the test. But for those of you who just want to make sure we're going to firstly sample the data. Normally you would have done this experimentally. We're going to have to use a computer to do the sampling. So we go to data, data menu, and at the bottom there's an option select cases. So we're going to click on that. So it's the data menu and then select cases. When we click on that, you get the select cases dialog box. And if you remember, we clicked on random sample of cases. So normally with your data, it's unlikely that you would do this, but this uh, is very useful for the purposes of demonstration. So your random sampling may have taken place in, um, experimentally. However, you can use this method. If you need to, if you have, say, a list of patients that you um, want to invite or to participate in a study or different arms of a study, you can use this functionality in SPSS to randomly assign people to different um, or randomly invite people to different parts of a study or to different treatment um, options. So it's a way of doing randomization in a clinical trial and it would be t perfectly valid in an ethics application to say that this was how you were going to do it. In, in an ethics application, the committee want to know how you're going to randomize your trial. 
it's okay to say randomize, but actually you need to specify how you're going to do that. And so if you said you're going to have a list and you're going to select them randomly using um, the random sampling function in SPSS, that is a way of doing it. So we're going to click on the sample button and I'm going to take approximately 1% of all cases. You can feel free to vary that number, but 1% uh, is what I want to work with. So just I'm just going to show you that again. So it's data. So we've got the data menu. Select cases, which is the second option from the bottom of that menu. You click on that you should get a box that looks like this. And then um, random sample, we're going to select random sample of cases and then click and then click on sample. There's a button there, sample. We get this box up and I'm going to say make sure that approximately is checked and then just type one in the box. So it should then read Sample size, approximately 1% of all cases. And then press continue, and then OK. Uh, and you can use the window um, button to make sure that you get back to the data view. So you will have seen this output window comes up. And it always comes up whenever, whenever, whenever SPSS does some uh, some function. It always generates this output, um, which can be slightly annoying, but we just learn to live with it. But you can go to the window option um, menu, and then here you'll see that I've got Trooper Rank as one of my uh, windows. And I select that, and then. As we saw last week, the random sampling has crossed out all of the cases, all of the rows that it hasn't selected. And because we've chosen only 1%, we're only going to get a few of these contribute into, um, into our study. Thank you, Sabah. 
So we've now uh, randomly sampled our data, so the weights of these um, two groups. And then if you remember, with, it, with SPSS, there's this analyze menu. Analyze is where most of the functionality sits. So if we want to do some kind of test, the first uh, port of call is the analyze menu. And we've already stated that we're going to use an independent samples t-test. Can anyone remind me what an independent samples t-test actually compares? What's the, um, it compares two numbers. What are those numbers that it compares? Anyone know? Take a guess. The answer isn't Star Wars or Stormtrooper. Okay, it's the means. So sample, uh, sample means. So a t-test compares means. So an independent samples t-test will compare the means of two independent samples. It's quite a lot given away in the name of the test, which is quite useful. So we want to compare means, so we can go to the compare means option in the menu. We want to compare independent samples, so we go to the independent samples t-test option in the menu. So we can click on that. And we have this dialog box, independent samples t-test dialog box comes up. We're comparing the weight in two groups. Remember our null hypothesis is that there is no difference in weight between the two groups or the um, the weight of the two groups or the mean weight of the two groups is the same. So we check that box there, see this little arrow, to put weight into the test variable. So select weight by clicking on it, click the arrow in the middle and it will appear in the test variables box. Now our grouping variable is our trooper type, that's clone trooper or storm trooper, or um, composite type, or dentist type. And we can define those groups. So, sorry, let me, so I, I transferred that, transferred that into the um, box in the same way. I clicked on trooper type, selected this lower arrow here, the second arrow down, and it moved over and you see type with two question marks comes up. And that's because we haven't defined which groups. Potentially in our data, we could have more than two groups. So SPSS wants to know which groups it is that we want to compare. And so we have to define those using the define groups button. We only have two groups and they are labeled one and two. So we have group one and group two. So in these box, type one, boxes rather, and two. And once you've done that, we press continue. And if you should see you have type one, two in that box. So you press define groups, put one and two in the group boxes there, and press continue, and then press OK. And you should get this kind of output. which hopefully will look familiar. And so can anyone remember from last week um, what we're looking at in these tables? Or can anyone tell me what, we, what we're seeing here? So remember in that research paper that they had some, um, a couple of tables and they stated what they saw. Can anyone tell me what we see in these uh, tables? The t sorry? That's right, so the two-tailed significance. Oh, um, here. I went right over it. 
represents the p-value. And um, for the purposes of being nice and conservative, we're going to just look at this equal variance is not assumed value. So we're actually going to look at that one there. So if you look at that value, um, what might you write in your uh, research article? Oh, there is no difference. Uh, yeah, and why? Okay, so we have uh, this value, our p value is greater than um, 0.05. Now, incidentally, ha um, how much variation do we get in this value? Does everyone see the same number that I see there, or do you all get different numbers? You'll get the same. Okay, so what we're going to do, well, firstly, we're going to write um, P equals 0 0.98, and therefore we reject the null hypothesis that, sorry, we accept the null hypothesis that there um, is no difference between the weight of clone troopers and stormtroopers. So there you go, we're done. Excellent, let's go home. Don't go home. Tempting as it may be. Yep, I'm... Okay, well what we're going to do, we're going to write some results. So we're going to do exactly that. We're going to say, um, we found that... Oh, if I can uh, get a pen to work. We found that P equals 0 0.98. Therefore, whoops. Therefore, we accept The null hypothesis that there is no difference between the weight. of, let's call them group one and group two, group one and group two. So that's what that table showed. And that's what we can write as a result of seeing that. So we found that there's no difference, there's statistically no difference We can, however, look here and just look at the, um, right, we can look here at the mean values and we can see there is a very slight difference in the means of those uh, two samples. But actually, we can also see that the mean value of group one, the stormtroopers, is 80.14 and the mean of group 2, the clone troopers, is 80.15. Now we're measuring weight in kilograms, it says here. So when we're measuring, we find a weight difference of um, 0.01 kilograms between two, uh, two groups, even if this had been statistically significant, 
do we think that the um, the effect size would have been of any practical significance? No. So it's we can talk about this term minimally important difference, and we could have set a a minimally important difference of one kilogram. And this is a really small difference in weight anyway. Now, what I want to do um, before we move on to multiple groups, I think we're an hour in and we haven't even done the, the multiple groups yet, is we're going to repeat this. The effect size is something, well, the, I've called it the effect size. The, the um, minimally important difference is something that you choose. It's your choice. We have to make choices. We choose our significance level that we're going to compare our p-values to. And we choose what's, say, cl clinically significant as an effect. So the weight between two groups, if, they, if we're trying to detect weight differences of, say, I don't know, uh, five kilograms between two groups, we've set our uh, minimally important difference of five, five kilograms. So you could get a statistically significant difference, but if it was, say, one kilogram, well, that's less than our minimally important difference of five kilograms. So we don't care. It might be statistically significant, but it ain't important. So we're, we're not going to worry about it. You can still write about that in your discussion and explain why a one kilogram difference between your two groups, as far as you're concerned in your practice, in your clinical practice, is not important. Um, you might be looking at weight loss in two independent groups who are going through two different types of diet. I know one on the high carb, one on the low carb diet. And at the end, you just want to compare the amount of weight loss, the weight, the, the average weight loss between the two groups. Now, would you care if one group was on average, oh, I don't know, point, point 0.1 of a kilogram lighter than the other group? Would you consider that um, of clinical importance or practical importance to the individuals having taken part in the study? Probably not, but you get to choose that and you have to justify it. And we did talk about this briefly last week and I just wanted to recap on that concept um, to point out that statistical significance isn't the be all and end all, but it comes in the context of the size of the difference that we're trying to detect. So this p-value that we got here was 0.98. So what we're going to do is we're going to write that down. I'd encourage you to open up an Excel spreadsheet or write it down on a piece of paper in front of you. We're going to write uh, this down. So hopefully that comes up. So for... Um, T test, and then we're going to have p value. So p equals 0.98, say. And now I'm going to go back to um, SPSS and I'm going to resample my data. So I'm going to do a second experiment um, for whatever reason. So I'm going to take some new samples, and we can do this quite easily. We go to the data menu again, select cases. Now everything's already been set up. So to resample the data, all you need to do is press um, OK. Now we have a new sample. So it's data, select cases, and just check something. Yep. And OK. And now we can run the t-test again and that will run a t-test on your new set of data so your second experiment 
So analyze, compare means, independent samples t-test. That's all set up, so we don't need to do anything. All we need to do is press OK. And what you then see when I've run a second experiment, so I've resampled the data, I've now got different cases in there. What's happened to my p-value? Okay, it's changed. So it's still a statistically insignificant result in that we're still going to conclude that there's no difference, but the p-value has changed. And this is a really important uh, concept to grasp, so that when we do one experiment, if we repeat that experiment, we might not get the same p-value. And in fact, sometimes we might see statistical significance, and other times we won't see st statistical significance. What this means is that even p-values have some variation. Are you just yawning? Okay. If you, if you want to yawn, try and do it nice and, uh, like, don't put your hand up while you're doing it, because it draws attention. Uh, anyway, likewise, if you want to fall asleep, do it probably at one of those computers over there, the faces of the people, um, people there. Okay. So that, uh, so what I'd like you to do is just repeat this a few times and write a list of p-values that you get out. So, um, I don't know, five or six times maybe. I'm going to do it here, um, and I'm going to record them back on my uh, sheet here. So, so p equals 0 0.71. So remember to resample it, you go to the data menu, select cases, and because it's all set up for random sampling, you just press OK. And once you've done that, uh, then you just rerun the t-test with com analyze, compare means, independent samples t-test, and press OK, because again, that's all set up. Um, for those of you watching, that the see the value there from the previous one was 0.71. So it's 71% chance that there's no difference between the um, two groups. So we've rejected the null hypothesis. The one I just ran this time is 0 .7, 0 0.079. That's roughly an 8% chance that there's no difference. So this is much closer to statistical significance. So I've sampled my data and I'm suddenly getting not statistically significant result by the 95% threshold, but I'm cutting it pretty close now. If we do this enough times, we will sometimes see a statistically significant result, and you may if, you, if you're going through this process yourself. So I'm going to write this down.
I don't know how many times you've managed to get through. Have you, do you see similar um, spread in the values to me? Has anyone managed to break the statistical significance threshold? No one's got a value less than 0 0.05. If we did it enough times, um, we would have. I've got here, I managed to get as low as 0 0.06 on one of mine. No, what we're showing is if I repeated, assuming that I randomly sample multiple times and do multiple experiments, everyone will get a slightly different p-value. And we're going to go on later to discuss sort of the implications of this, but I want to get this concept um, firmly embedded now that the p-value is, uh, the p-value itself will have a distribution. So in any measurement we have, always has a distribution, it has some uncertainty around it. So it has some inherent variation. And we can reduce the variation by increasing the number of samples, or increasing the sample size. So anyway, we're just going to keep that list. And if you've made your own list, um, just keep it to hand. So. As we said in our, our results, um, we've rejected, uh, we've accepted the null hypothesis and said between those two groups, there is no weight difference. And actually, maybe multiple groups have carried out our experiments and everyone's found that. So we become, as more experiments have been done, we've become increasingly confident um, in that result. But if I go back to last week and this idea that what kick-started all of these experiments was the anecdotal evidence that there are some differences um, in heights that was. And maybe we're still concerned about differences or we're aware of variation um, in, in our thing that we're measuring. I'm measuring stormtroopers. And so then we can perhaps propose that if there's no difference between these types of trooper, stormtrooper and clone trooper, perhaps um, there's something else that drives a difference. Uh, and, and because these are military personnel, I, I have assigned them ranks. And I do apologize if you're more knowledgeable in this area than I am. I don't know if those are strictly the right order and I don't even know if I've spelled them correctly but you get the idea we've got some categories that we've now placed these in but how many categories do we have five that's more than two is it not statistics five is more than two so can we use an independent samples t-test to compare these five groupings why not Anyone want to know? Tell me why we can't use a t-test to compare these multiple groupings? Because a t-test only, is only for comparing two groups, so that's a very good answer. And it is what we said earlier. And there are more subtleties to this, which we will also discuss very shortly. But you're right, we can't. Um, but we have this uh, burning research question now that is derived from our previous one. So we've done a bit of research, we found something out, and now we come up with some more questions. Research always leads to more questions. And so the new question that we have, or, or that I have is, is the weight of multiple groups different? So here I've, I've, my, I've, I've called it groups. For me personally, the question is, is the weight of the multiple ranks of stormtrooper or clone trooper um, different. And consequently, I have a null hypothesis, and I only have a single null hypothesis here, and that is that all of the groups have the same weight. Sabah would like so, to uh, contribute. Let's compare the need 
value of carry on using a project in good place and in such also project as you have the other group who receives no inspection and no priority to good place. Okay? And the third group who use no priority to the base, they use the normal one that they get some instructions about how to plant their seed. And so on. You have many groups and you won't see where is uh, where is the difference or which group is uh, for example benefiting more from this intervention and what is the, the, the uh, what is the effect of this difference? Why we do that? Because if we go in for example to the intervention for children, for example, and their level of care, we want first to run this intervention and we will see which intervention is working better. Okay? Exactly. Here there's another example that Sophie is telling you because uh, to ask people different backgrounds, then you're going to have different, different questions. Okay? Thank you, Sabah. In fact, I'll add uh, to what Sabah has just said and go back to the paper that I handed out at the beginning. So in that paper, if, if we remind ourselves that they're measuring the weight to some different um, composite materials, or dental, different dental materials, uh, to find out uh, some physical property of them. And they have said that they compare these multiple these multiple groups these multiple groups of different materials and so here i have a uh, private sergeant lieutenant captain and commander or rank as my grouping variable my label to group um, weight by in this paper they've grouped the weights by the different material And if we want to set a single null hypothesis, that can be there is no difference in the weight of any of the groups. And if we have that null hypothesis, so that's, that's not specific to one group. That's not saying that um, commanders are heavier than captains, or uh, actually that would be a two test, but it's not saying commander is uh, it's the commander that's heavier than someone else, or the commander weighs some, some uh, weighs different to the others. We're saying that there's just no difference between any of the any of them. We don't care who it might be, but our null hypothesis is there is no grip difference in the mean weight in any of the groups, or all of the groups have the same mean weight. And when we have a null hypothesis like that that can be tested using analysis of variance. So in this case, we have a, um, so the null hypothesis, all of the groups have the same mean weight. And again, if we do a, a randomly sample um, of 1% one, 1 of all cases, we measure their weight. But this time we're going to test that specific null hypothesis using analysis of variance. And again, we're going to use SPSS to do that. And the fantastic thing about this is, of course, we've already set this up. And we are just one menu click away from a Nobel Prize winning paper. So we go right back to our trusty software, our trusty calculator. And we know that to answer that null hypothesis, we use analysis of variance. Uh, analysis of variance is a parametric test. Remember, parametric tests rely on the normal distribution, which is parameterized by mean and standard deviation. And therefore, it compares the means of multiple groups. That's all it does. It says, is the mean of all of these groups statistically the same? Could this mean, the mean of all of these groups just come from one, one group 
if I'd taken several several uh, samples from one group, would the mean have um, the mean of all of those samples fitted in the range that I've got here? And to answer that question, we go to analyze. Because we're comparing means, we get to compare means. And at the bottom of there, we have one way ANOVA or one way analysis of variance. That's not one way or another. Um, and it's one way analysis of variance. And I have no idea how I clicked on a paired samples t test. So hopefully you didn't do that. It's just a test if see if people are awake. Okay, analyze. So we've remember we've already sampled the data. So we've taken our one percent sample already. So we're going to stick with that. I'm not going to change it. Um, so I'm going to analyze, and I'm going to compare means, one way analysis of variance. You will see, in fact, you'll see in this research article too, it, in the second part of their, <coughs> pardon me, in the second part of their statistics, they use a two-way analysis of variance. We're not going to cover that in this course. Uh, I think it's more important just to get to grips with the one-way analysis of variance. And I will leave um, investigation of what two-way is uh, to your curiosity in your own uh, reading and um, research time. So we've got one way analysis of variance. The dependent list, the thing that we're interested in comparing is weight. And the factor, the thing that we want to use to divide up or categorize our weight data is the rank. Um, Check something. So you should have a, a box that looks like so. Now, if you press OK, it will run the test for you, and you'll get another one of these famous SPSS tables. And it's, there we go. So it says and over at the top. And does anyone want to offer some opinion as to what that means? What might that ANOVA table mean? I know that people are desperate to answer my questions. Pardon? Yes, well, I've, I've used 1%. If you, if you haven't used 1%, that's up to you. So remember, the thing to be looking out for here is that word SIG. What's SIG? The p-value. So that's our probability value. And that's the one that we're comparing. Now, if you're interested in mathematics and the intricacies of what's been done here, you can look at all of the other values. But actually, the thing that we're really interested in uh, for the purposes of this course, and, and it is the reason that there is sometimes an overstated interest in p-values, is because this is the thing that we read out. It's the useful output um, from these tables. So it's here. But as we've just demonstrated, um, using the t-test is that p-values themselves vary and that's why we don't want to get too hung up on them because they vary you know you do the experiment again you'll get a different value they're a probability they're useful they're indicators but they're not the end of the story and that's why we draw in lots of other information um, and discuss the validity of what we've done but we have to have some way of making decisions and so here we see that we have a p-value of 0 0.015. You may have a slightly different value. I don't know. People have, is there a variation from this? Yeah? 
Anyone, what's the highest value? Who thinks they might have the highest value? What do you have? Sorry? Okay, we've got 0 3 so that's a very significant. Anyone going the other way? Let's say, what do we have over there? 0 0.06, so you would be rejecting the null hypothesis and you would be strongly accepting the null hypothesis. I say strongly, uh, I shouldn't have said that. You will be accepting the um, null hypothesis. So there, then the only way to resolve that, um, it, I don't know if anyone watches Harry Hill, but um, is fight. No, don't have a fight. It won't be pretty. We might just do some more research. So um, I got 0 0.015, so I'm siding with you. I am rejecting the null hypothesis null hypothesis. So when we say we're rejecting the null hypothesis, in this case, what are we saying? Okay, so there is a difference. Do you remember what, the way that I rephrased the um, null hypothesis? I said, so, I, but when I wrote the null hypothesis in brackets underneath, I had said that the weight of all groups is the same. So if I reject the null hypothesis, what am I saying? The weight of all groups is not the same. So how many groups need to be different? One. Just at, if, if only if all of the groups except one are different. Oh, sorry, if all the groups are the same except one, we still reject the null hypothesis. So the ANOVA doesn't tell us any more information other than there is some statistical difference. There are some statistical variations amongst our groups, but it doesn't tell us which groups are varying. It just tells us that statistically, yeah, there's some variation. Now, from our perspective, being very interested in weight variations amongst um, the rank of stormtroopers or the weight variations amongst um, different dental composites that have been stored in water. From that perspective, this might be interesting because it answers our research question, which was, is there a difference in the weight um, amongst these different categories? And we believe that there is, having done this. Now, um, there's one person over there who doesn't believe uh, that there is a difference. So let's um, do as we did previously. We're going to uh, run, actually, maybe we don't have to run this a few more times. If we've got enough values around the room, I will write those down. So I'm going to write down mine. Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's the next, yeah. Sabra wants to know whether we're going to go beyond 1% sample size. She's very concerned. As you can see, Sabra is fully engaged with uh, Stormtrooper sampling, uh, and, I, and I fully encourage this. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to just go back to my page here. And so now I'm going to write, and you can do the same, or you can simply watch. I'm going to write here and over. Um, so you had, was it 0 0.003? Okay, so we've got P equals 0 0.003. We had P equals 0 0.06. Um, I had 0 0.015. I'm going to call that 0 0.02. I don't see the point in, in reporting p-values um, to very uh, high precision, except in the case that you're doing very high sample numbers. Um, because if the variation amongst the numbers is so big, the uh, precision d down into the fifth decimal place, place often doesn't mean anything. Okay, so do we have any other values? Someone can give me a value that they've got. You've got a 0 0.05. Oh, that's an interesting one itself. So we've got a 0 0.05 there. Are we rejecting or are we accepting the null hypothesis? Reject, we've got an Okay, no, well, I'll come to that in a second, okay. So we got a 0 0.05. Now this actually just, um, 
depending how you specify your threshold level, your alpha, your level at which you're going to reject the null hypothesis. So you will see, so in the paper we just looked at, we saw um, in brackets, they said alpha is less than 0.05. So in this case, this one here, we would still have to accept the null hypothesis because it's equal to, not less than. However, in some papers, you will see sometimes written alpha is less than or equal to, that line underneath meaning equal to, so less than or equal to 0.05. In this case, we would reject null hypothesis. Does that make sense? So it's all down to the choice you make in specifying um, what your threshold value is. Okay, so we've got some uh, p-values of 0. something like that, yeah? All that's telling us is we've got a really small p-value. Virtually, in your data set, in the sample that you took, you can be absolutely certain, well, not absolutely certain, but there's a vanishingly small probability um, that the difference that you observe between the groups could have happened by chance. That's what it means. It's just a very small number. And it's smaller than um, SPSS is going to print out in a table. So it might have been um, 0 0.001 or something like that. But it doesn't print out that far. So after the third decimal place, it says, you know what? There's no difference. Sorry, there is a difference. There's definitely a difference. So we've got at least two of those. We've got any other values that I can add to my? No, we've got 40 of people in the room and um, we've only got six p-values. That's fine. It demonstrates the point. So here we have some that are statistically significant. So some of these studies, they would have found a difference between the groups. And some of the studies wouldn't have found a difference between the groups. So now what we can do is we can think, well, perhaps we have a sample size issue um, and we can increase the sample size. Um, but we're not going to do that now. We're going to, um, I think we're just going to write some results down. And then we're going to take a break. Okay, so there we go. I've just summarized on that slide what the analysis of variance does. It compares the means from multiple samples, that's more than two samples, and it gives the probability that the means of all the groups are the same, or from the same distribution. And we get a significant difference if at least one of those means comes from a different distribution. And it makes this assumption that the data is normally distributed. So we now have to write some results. So what are we going to write in our results section? Oh. Yep. We're going to come to that. So the question uh, was about if we take in our sampling, if we haven't taken a very big sample, we might have missed out some of the groups. So if, you've, if you look at your um, data set, you might find that you don't have any commanders in your data set. Um, and so what's that going to do? Well, that, we're actually going to come on to that after we've had a break. And so I'm glad you've asked the question, because that means that you're so excited that you're going to take a really short break and just rush back um, to get on with this um, exciting study, or at least to, to get it over and done with. But before we go on to do it, so in fact, what in, in, the, in this particular example, all I'm going to say is we would note that in our discussion. So that is a discussion point. And we'd note it down in our discussion that we don't think we've picked up all of the ranks, so the sample size might not be big enough. Um, and when we're reporting these results, does anyone want to come and write down the um, 
or tell me what, what I should write for the results section here. So that's the, well, for me, that's the um, results of my experiment. And I know that as we've uh, discovered, some of us have different results. But what I'm simply going to say is, uh, is that, hang on, I'm going to go back to here. here. So I'm going to write something like um, at least one group um, has a different mean weight. from the other groups. And then in brackets, I'm going to tell people why I believe that, because I got a p equals 0.015. For those of you that got a p equals to 0 0.0000, the way that you'd report that would be something like p is much less than 0.05 or whatever your chosen threshold level. So you've got a threshold level here. And this thing here just means much less than. So that reads P is much less than the threshold level. It's much less than 5%, yep. Sorry, can you ask the question again? Thanks, Heather. Um, can I also add uh, to that? So you're, you, you've written um, that there, you've just written that there is a difference between the um, mean weights, which is true. The reason that I've been quite um, specific here that at least one group has a different mean weight is really to highlight that when I do an analysis of variance, 
I am tested that I, if I get a significant result that means that at least one group differs and so that's my null hypothesis so the question was I'm highlighting the weakness I'm not I wouldn't call it a weakness I'm just highlighting exactly what it does so I'm stating this is what analysis of variance does and it's quite a useful habit to get into because it it clarifies in your mind as a researcher exactly what it is that you're testing um, because we can it's easy to say there is a difference in the weight but actually well, what aspect of the weight am I testing and when I do an analysis of variance one I'm testing is the mean different the, is, is the mean of the groups different but I'm specifically can only test with analysis of variance if at least one of those means differs if we make the general statement that the means of the groups differ that could imply that they all differ and so I'm trying to get away from any implication by being very very verbose about what it um, states so we've just done the analysis of variance and although we have seen some variation amongst the p-values so sometimes we would reject the null hypothesis and say that there's at least one difference in the mean of the groups and sometimes we would accept it but it seems that more often than not we would have rejected the null hypothesis so I'm going to go with my result which uh, is that the analysis of variance result is statistically significant But that's all it tells us. All it tells us is there, it, that there is at least one difference. And as I've said, uh, as with all good research, this leads to further questions. And my question, which follows from that result, is which sample means are different? That doesn't seem an unreasonable question to ask. Once we've discovered a difference, we'd really like to know where that difference comes from, what's different. Um, and so this is where we get into this issue of comparing multiple means. So we have means from we have a mean weight for each group, for each rank. Um, in the paper that we had, they had a mean um, sorption value that was derived from the weight. A, a mean sorption value for each composite type and if we want to know which ones are different from each other then we need to compare them all naively we could think okay well I could do multiple t-tests I could think of every permutation of um, of categories and just compare those using multiple t-tests and if we do that we're actually asking multiple we actually have multiple null hypotheses that we're testing so here I, I've just stuck with my example where we have five ranks from private, uh, from private through to commander so if I were to compare all of my different groups I would end up with 10 null hypotheses I think unless I've missed something out but hopefully you'll get the idea if I if I have made an error so I've listed all of the null hypotheses that I would need to test Does that makes sense we're, we've now got we're comparing every group to every other group so here I have the weight of privates is no different to the weight of sergeants as you see um, and if we were doing this by a t-test we'd actually be comparing the means so it'd be the mean weight of privates is no different to the mean weight of sergeants likewise the weight of privates is no different to the weight of lieutenants so captains commanders and then having exhausted all uh, compared privates to all of the other uh, ranks then we move on to comparing sergeants to all of the other ranks except private which has already been compared um, which is that second comparison so 
this second sorry this that first comparison there is where we compare sergeants to privates so we don't need to compare that one again and so then you go through comparing sergeant to lieutenant to captain to commander and then lieutenants to captains lieutenants to commanders and finally we end up with comparing the captains to the commanders and then every compar comparison would have been made but we now have a set of 10 null hypotheses that we're testing now the problem arises when we try to do multiple t-tests in that if we're testing multiple hypotheses the chance that we're going to see um, a rare event or that we're going to get one of these um, p-values that's rare like our uh, like we've seen in the variation of p-values already is somewhat increased because we're now not just testing one null hypothesis we're testing 10 null hypotheses so actually we're more likely to um, to incorrectly reject the null hypothesis so when I say incorrectly reject the null hypothesis I mean okay actually there isn't really a difference but I'm going to say, uh, um, but my p-value tells me there is. And sometimes that will happen, as we've seen um, already, that there's a variation. Um, in fact, for the, for the ANOVA data that we just looked at, I know that there is a difference. I, I generated that data. I didn't really collect it from stormtroopers. I made it up. And I know that there is a difference between every rank. But at least one individual in their sampling found that there was no difference between any of the groups. But I know that there what that I know there is. But the experiment didn't see it. Now, if you use large enough sample sizes, that's unlikely to occur. But it still can happen. And if we ask multiple null hypotheses, like we've got here, then the chance of seeing that kind of incorrect rejection of the null hypothesis is increased. So here, I've written it here. here. So you increase, as you increase the number of null hypotheses that you need to test, so that could be increasing the number of um, comparisons that you're trying to make, you then increase the chance of rejecting the null hypothesis when there really is no difference. So there's no difference, but actually, if I if I reject the null hypothesis, I might reject the null hypothesis because I get a p-value. So we might find, um, you know, you do these comparisons, multiple t-tests, and maybe let's say there really is a difference here. So I know there really is a difference. And so we might get, so we do it the first time, we're going to get p equals 0 0.01. We're going to get there, p equals 0 0.04. p equals 0 0.03. And so we're rejecting the null hypothesis correctly. So uh, yeah, correctly rejecting the null hypothesis. But what about here? Maybe on this one, we got p equals 0. 5, 1. And so I'm going to accept the null hypothesis. I'm going to say there's no difference. But I know that there really is. And the chance of seeing this kind of thing is increased simply because I have more null hypotheses that I'm asking. And this is a problem. Because we have to be really careful that we don't fall into this trap. Now, there is this thing um, called the Bonferroni correction. And this is considered to be the most conservative way of dealing with this problem. There are all sorts of other fancy mathematical ways of dealing with this issue. But you may see this. So sometimes you'll see in a paper that multiple t-tests or multiple Mann-Whitney u-tests were done. Remember, the Mann-Whitney u-test compares data sets when we 
can't assume or don't want to assume um, normality of the data. In fact, it, can, it compares the median um, of the data. But in, in the same way that T-test compares two groups, the man whitney U-test compares two groups. So it's appropriate for testing these kind of hypotheses where we're comparing one thing to the other, the two groups. So if we're going to use multiple T-tests or multiple man whitney um, U-tests and get multiple P-values to decide whether we reject or accept each of these hypotheses, the Bonferroni correction says we have to divide our threshold value. So normally, let's say we default to this threshold of 0.05, and we're only going to reject the null hypothesis if our p-value is less than 0.05. Well, what Bonferroni said was if you've got 10 um, hypotheses, then you need to divide that value by 10. So now we have a new threshold value, and we're going to compare each of these hypotheses to a threshold value of 0.005. So it's much stricter. So we've got to be really sure there's a difference um, before we will reject each of these null hypotheses. So that when we combine them, we reduce the risk of seeing one of these rare events, one of these um, mistakenly rejecting the null hypothesis incorrect rejection of the null hypothesis. I'll mention this later, uh, but it's technically that's called a type 1 error. But you don't need to get bogged down on that just at this second. What you really need to be aware of is that if you're doing multiple, um, multiple comparisons, which are defined by multiple hypotheses like this, then you need some kind of correction. Fortunately, when we're in the parametric regime, so we can use t-tests and analysis of variance, our giant calculator called SPSS has built-in functions and built-in solutions to this problem. So um, if we do analysis of variance and we want to do a multiple comparison to determine which of our groups were different um, from the other ones, then it has some options. Now, as you'll see in a minute, there's multiple options to check. I think by far the most commonly used one is Tukey's test. And this is just a mathematical way of correcting um, the error or the accumulated error in the p-values. So a bit like Bonferroni's correction, which is simply dividing our threshold value by the number of hypotheses. Well, we don't even need to think about that because we can check this box in SPSS and it does all the correction for us. And then it just gives us p-values that we can look at and interpret. But it is useful to have some broad understanding of why this has to be done. Okay, so we are going to get back into SPSS. Hopefully you left it open. You know, never to close SPSS when in these sessions. And here I have the result from my analysis of variance still on the screen. And it says that there's a statistically significant difference between at least one of the groups and um, the others, or statistically significant difference in the mean of one of the groups and the others. Now we can rerun this test again on the analyze menu. Remember it's comparing means, so you go to the compare means option, which is the fourth one down. And then at the bottom of the submenu that pops out, we will have one-way analysis of variance. And if you click on there, you'll get one-way and over. I'll just show you that again. So we have analyze, compare means, fourth option down. And at the bottom of the submenu that pops out to the right, we have one-way analysis of variance, one-way and over. And click on that, 
and the dialog box clicks up. Now this should still be populated from previously. So um, hopefully you've still got it like this with weight in the dependent list and rank in the factor uh, list or as the factor. Now there's this button here that I've highlighted which says postdoc, this one here. If you click on postdoc, it gives you a variety of multiple comparison um, tests that you can do. So it calls these postdoc multiple comparison tests. And you'll see there's the Bonferroni correction there. And you can click on that if you wish. But there's two key here. So that's the one that I'm going to recommend we use. I think various um, mathematical geniuses will argue for different the merits of different corrections. I will argue that since we almost certainly violate every assumption the mathematicians made and um, we need to apply some common sense, we'll use two key and just take it with a pinch of salt. Yeah, so you'll see in some papers, Sab is just saying, you will see in some papers Bonferroni as well. And it just gives more conservative um, values. It... But for now, we use two key. You can check on any of these you like and compare the values if you like. Uh, and, and certainly, you're welcome to read around the subject and come to your own conclusions as to which, which tests you can use. I should mention, if you if you um, are if you are asked a question about um, an appropriate way to do this, you should be able to at least justify why you would use a particular method. Thank you. 
need to do that. So that's what, what that's what, what why we are here. Not just to teach you the concept, to help you to understand later on how we're going to deal with your research question. Okay. Thank you, Saba. So hopefully you have managed to replicate the screen that I have there, and you may have gone ahead and pressed continue, which is fine. So we're going to apply this post hoc Tukey test. So I'll refer to it as a post hoc Tukey test or Tukey's test. You press continue and then OK. And you'll see the familiar analysis of variance box comes up with the same significance value. I haven't resampled my data. I haven't done another experiment. So I'm still working with the same data set. But this time, I now have a multiple comparisons box. Now, you may have a different, um, in fact, it's very likely you will have a different multiple comparisons box. And what you may also notice is that in mine, I only have three ranks. And this was something that was mentioned before the break, that somebody had noticed in their data set that they hadn't managed to capture all of the, um, all of the ranks. And therefore, what would you say about the sampling? Anyone? Yep. It's a small sample. It's inappropriate. It hasn't captured or it's not representative of my population. But even so, we've got what we've got. And we can at least look at this table and see what it tells us about the data that we did get and that we did acquire. So again, it's given us lots of numbers. In fact, this time, most of those numbers are useful. So here we have the difference in the means of each of the groups. So here we've got the comparison between private and sergeant. And there is a difference in the means of minus 1.16. Here the units are kilograms because we're measuring weight. So it's minus 1.16 kilograms, about a kilogram difference in the sample between um, a private and a sergeant. Standard error, do you remember that's the um, quantity that we could calculate from the standard deviation by dividing by the square root of the sample size? And then it gives us, uh, and, and it gives us a confidence interval here, and that confidence interval is is based on the standard error, and it just says, okay, well, there's a mean difference here. The mean difference is this, but actually, we're 95% confident that it, the real value, the real difference, sits somewhere um, between minus two and minus 0.2 kilograms. And then we have our p-value here. And it says, in our sample, there is about a 1% probability that we would have observed this difference in the means, so that difference there, if the um, two groups were actually the same. So there's about a 1% chance that we would have seen that even if the groups are the same. And so under our 5% significance threshold, we can reject the non-hypothesis in this case, that there is no difference between private, the weight of a private and the weight of a sergeant. So we're gonna say, there, it, there, it looks like there is a difference in the weight between privates and sergeants. Would anyone li like to, um, would anyone like to try and explain the second line down? So here we have a comparison between a private and a lieutenant. I look up expecting to see a room full of hands raised and excited faces. And I see people who are on the verge of sleep and um, self-harm. So. Um, anyone? Okay. 
I will continue. So we're going to compare. So this box is say, simply saying comparing private the weight of the privates to the weight of the lieutenants. There is a mean difference of 0.1. So the difference in the means of those two samples is 0.1 kilograms. And statistically, we have to accept that null hypothesis. There's no difference. Now that's interesting because I know that there's a difference. I made the data up and I know there's a difference, but we haven't been able to detect it in this, um, in this data set. And so on, you, you can go on and you'll see that some of these are uh, replicated. So the comparison here, Lieutenant Sergeant has a p-value of 0.49 and here it's sergeant to lieutenant 0.49 so there's replication because they've done every combination of course some of those are the same so now we can go through each of our null hypotheses Yeah, when you get that book, just go to uh, what we call it, um, uh, option, yeah, and then you will find descriptive, click descriptive, and then continue, and then continue again everything, and then you will get table telling you the mean value for every group of the standard deviation and standard error. This is what tells you the extent of the analysis as well. Okay? Did you get it? So, for example, if you can't sometimes read that table, if you look at this very simple table, maybe it's very easy to miss that the mean for the group are close to each other. You get it? Thanks, Saba. Well, there you go. More information. You'll often find under the options box that you can check something and get more information. So that's a really useful table to be able to plot out. So now we can see the means of all of our groups. And so we can eyeball the comparison and then we can see the statistical result of the comparison here. So let's say if we're comparing sergeant to lieutenant, you say, well, the weight of a sergeant appears to be larger than that of a lieutenant. We go down to this table here and we say, compare sergeant to lieutenant. The difference is about the kilogram. And the probability of obtaining that difference, even when there's really no difference, is 0.49. So actually, we're going to say we have to accept the null hypothesis in this case. There is no difference between the um, weight of sergeants and lieutenants, at least in our sample. But of course, we've raised concerns about the sample size already. So let's increase the sample size. Let's um, do this experiment again, but with this time we're going to up the percentage of samples to 10% of the population and see what happens. So we go to, uh, we've been working at 1%. Well, I've been working at 1%. Yeah, everyone's got random, random selection. Okay, so just to reiterate, 
this is the purpose of rerunning the experiment multiple times. Every time we sample the data, we get a different random selection. So we get different people in our selection. And then when we run the tests, we will all get different p-values. So some of you will have got um, sampled a different set or 1% of the um, people than I did. So when I ran the analysis on my group, I'll get one p-value, you may get another. And we need to understand that p-values have their own distribution and they vary. Depend and it's entirely down to the sample that you obtained in your experiment and the sample that I obtained in my experiment. And they will differ and so we will get different p-values. And this is what I want you to see, I want, because this is an important concept uh, to grasp. So um, that was with 1% of the data. So we're gonna, I said we're going to up, up this now to take 10% of the individuals contained in this population. And so we go to the data menu and to select cases one up from the bottom of that menu, that's select cases on the data menu, data, select cases. And then we're going to click on this sample button, the button. So make sure you have random sample of cases checked there, and then sample. And here you'll see that I've got approximately 1% of all cases. So I've got one in the box. And now I'm going to change that to make that 10. And so if you do the same, we're now sampling 10% of the cases of the people in that file. So it's 10% of my population. Oh, because well, uh, that defeats the object. Sab is asking um, why we don't just do it on everyone in the file. Everyone in the file is as if that's the whole population. And if we could go out every time and in our experiments measure the whole population, then we actually wouldn't need statistics. So that'd be great because we wouldn't need to worry about probability because we'd know with certainty what everyone was like. The issue is we can't, in most circumstances, measure everything or cover all of the bases. So we have to look at probability or chance. So we're just looking at a subset. We're looking at a sample of that population. And we're seeing how changing the size of that sample or just taking a different sample affects our experimental results. So this should help us when we come to writing discussion or reporting our results. So it helps us decide whether we really believe what we found out or really believe um, our, our results. So hopefully we're on 10% um, of all cases. I'm going to press continue. OK, and now I have taken 10%, a random 10% 10, 10 selection from that file. And this time, I'm going to rerun my uh, post, uh, analysis of variance um, and postdoc test. So I'm going to go to the Analyze menu. Compare means one way and over. So you should have that. And if you click on the one way and over option, Everything should still be there from previously. So weight in the dependent list and rank in the factor uh, box. And then on the postdoc, we should have two key checked. So you press continue, OK. Now this time, I don't know, you may or may not have commander in your list. But you'll see here that I, under the descriptives, now have every rank represented. However, under N, which is the number of samples, I've only actually got one commander in there. And so you'll see that all of these other values are blank because you can't take a mean and a standard deviation, well, you can take a mean of one, it's the same as the original value. But you can't take a standard deviation or a standard error or a confidence interval of one measurement because one measurement doesn't vary, it's just one measurement. 
But if we go down and we look at the ANOVA and the Oh, there we go. So I've even got a warning there. It says post-op tests are not performed for weight in kilograms because at least one group has fewer than two cases. I don't know if any of you have also had this warning. Um, so that's telling me I haven't actually taken quite enough um, to do the post-op test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to up my sample size. I'm going to say I'm now going to sample... 25% of the cases. Now I'm going to reanalyze the data. Now, once again, I've only got one commander, so the postdoc hasn't hasn't come out. And this is a, a this 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 happens. Um, We'll do experiments and we'll think everything's uh, going fine. And then we'll find some category that we only pick up one or two of. And then we think, well, is that just a random? Is it is it random that commanders exist? Or is it just there's not very many? Yes. OK, so the question is, um, I've said that the N is the number of um, the, the, the number of samples and why is the num n value for private um, well here it's nearly 25,000 and the sergeants um, it's two and a half thousand and for lieutenants it's 250 the captain it's 25 and one commander and this is, I've taken 25% of my population. Now, obviously, as you know, that I'm a real stickler for reality, and I wanted to make this as realistic as possible. So I said, when I created this data set, that I think we have um, I don't know, 100,000 individuals in this. Uh, well, I think it was 100,000 people with the rank of private. And so 25% of them is about 25,000. But I said that you wouldn't have the same number of um, sergeants, so I've decreased it, and I've just decreased it by 10 each time. So we have unequal representation within the population. Um, now, you may ask questions about bias and such and such, and they would be valid discussion points. But that's why we don't have the same number. In the population, they aren't equally represented. And actually, if you were reporting your results, this may be something that you'd report. You'd be saying, OK, well, I've got this data, and this is telling me that when I've sampled it, there's not an equal number of each rank within the armed forces. Or there's um, not an equal number of dental composite specimens, depending on what we've done. All I want to do, though, is get this so that I can get more than one commander. And so maybe for this to work, let's say I'm going to sample 50%, and hopefully. So I'm now going to take half of everyone, see if I can get enough people into the, um, so I can, do, uh, I can get everyone represented. Ah, I have. I've now got four commanders. So now the postdoc test has run. And what does it tell me? Let's look, look at this. It's now comparing the rank of private to all the other ranks. And if I look down this column, I see a statistically significant difference between the rank of private to all other ranks, or the weight of that rank. Because remember, weight is what we're comparing here. 
And actually, maybe what I want to do is just look, because most of these look statistically significant, I'll look for the ones where actually there isn't a statistically significant difference. So lieutenant compared to captain, they appear to have the same weight. In my data, you may have different results. So your p-values may be different. So the point here is, is to really show that if we want to compare multiple things, we have a set of multiple hypotheses and we have to be aware that we need to correct the p-values. And if you do that using analysis of variance and a post hoc Tukey test, that is all taken care of for you. If you are using um, non-parametric data and have to use something like the Mann-Whitney U test, then you may have to manually apply a um, Bonferroni correction to the p-values. Okay, these uh, slides are, I don't think we're going to fill these in now, but they're just there for you to, um, when it comes to going back over this, these slides, maybe these will provide prompts for you to um, think about the kinds of things that you might uh, include in a discussion. Uh, Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you finish your analysis and you get your results, yeah, in your result chapter, because the iron one or all this magnificent problem, you will count up your results. You have, when you read your paper, when you start reading your papers, related to your research question, can you please um, try to see how the other presented their uh, results? Learn from them and keep it in your head that. One day you will go back and you, you will ask, how can I present my results? And if you feel that your results are your push, uh, your test question is relevant to one paper, more relevant to one paper, keep that paper aside, look how they present their results, and you may, uh, I'm not advising to be based, but at least it would help you to reflect, to reflect and uh, present your results in a better way than they did. Okay? But don't, don't get stuck how far I, I present my results or what sort of results. Because when we show you now in this analysis of the atmosphere, you have many tables and many things. You're not, you're not, you're not asked to do all of this, uh, I mean, to present all of these results. You have to present the right results that make the examiner, especially the Bible examiner, understand what is your research question, how did you address your research question, what are the results, and then the last thing, how would you discuss this result. Now, Dr. B is in last session and this session, he demonstrates you how to convert the mean value of two groups, which is what we call it, and Berkey test. You have to be very careful. There is Berkey test, there is Andrex. Berkey test is when you go going to examine the group under the first condition and then in the second condition. The Andrex, that we call it independent or Andrex test, when you have two different groups whether you measure in terms or whatever or material. Okay? Then if I'm going to present, for example, my test, it's very simple. You're going to have at least three columns of your table. You, the first uh, column is about the group. You have group one, group two. And then the first column, you're going to have, for example, the mean and the standard deviation for the first group, and the mean and the standard deviation for the second group. And then if you compare, as a t test is the main function of it to compare the mean value, you're going in the third, in the third uh, uh, column, you're going to have your d value with the confidence interval. You will find the confidence interval in the t test that it can give you. And this is the, the simple way how you're going to present your results. You don't, you don't, you are not allowed to discuss anything in the result chapter or in the research section of a paper, your results. You just you have to demonstrate what is the outcome of your results. I am here com uh, combining the research part with the statistics. So it's not our job, but I'm trying to make the life more easy for you and to understand how the right papers are doing. So in, this, in the analysis or in the, in the research part, just you have to present what you have fun. And then in the discussion, you're going to say, this is our results, whether you are 
in line with that with the current research or whether you are adding alternatives or whether you are contradicting what's going on. Okay? So this is uh, what is the main finding. And then what is the practical significance of the results? If you find your results, if you find for example you have two group of children and you compare them for example with respect of carry the giving intervention and you find for example the differences in sales after six months of intervention, only one person, then you have to ask your, yourself, are we going for example to accept this intervention? And if we're going to accept it, you have to justify it. Or either you're going to say, okay, this intervention is good, but maybe because we have very small samples or maybe we have just run this, uh, this uh, intervention in a very small area, we need to do further research. It needs to be so your, yeah, uh, it's answering all the other explanation. How could take this research forward? Uh, I'm answering the last question. How can we take it forward? If you, for example, you want to convince me that your intervention is good, then you have to convince me and how are we going to take it forward to make it a feeling and we need to predict how we need to change what is in that country. What about the second question? What are the limitations? Whenever you have your results and you're going to discuss it, you have to be honest and you have to tell what's the limitation. For example, you might run your uh, analysis in a, in, a, in a country where it's very hot. Very hot. So maybe the, the condition of the lab affecting your results. So you could you could reflect on this, and as well you could have, for example, many things. Uh, if you are, for example, dealing with human, I am, for example, uh, always uh, always researching uh, behavior like tobacco use. We sometimes we don't find, I mean, a dealing with those because we are dealing with human. They will they will they will they will call us for social disability. <laughs> if I ask someone in the hospital, do you smoke? It's often they say no. Why? You know, social doctor accepting a doctor will not accept the patient who has told you about smoke. It's a very established research that uh, that tobacco causing cardiovascular. So uh, then you could reflect on that that uh, this is what's going on and this is what of, uh, one of the limitations that for example is that for the soul. And what else? Yeah. Yeah. And then what other explanation? It could be many things you could explain according to your research question. So, did you understand so far how we link statistics, results, that question? We will keep talking with you until we finish the schedule and we will see how it goes <laughs> when, when we combine these things together. Thank you, Sabah. So, if we take what we have just covered um, with our example of stormtroopers, and now look back at the paper that we had at the beginning of the session. Hopefully, the results make a little bit more sense compared to um, when we first looked at them. So if you look at table two on page 198, I might even be able to bring that up. It only seems to have one page there. Hang on. Okay. So they said that they used analysis of variance and two keys test. Well, we've just used, and, and they're essentially comparing weight differences between two, uh, between multiple specimens. Now, we've just used analysis of variance and Tukey's test to compare the weight or weight differences between multiple groups. And when we looked at the output, we could see that sometimes there was a statistically significant difference between um, between some, and there wasn't a statistically significant difference between others in in our results. And so here, where they say, um, 
it says that means in a column with the same superscript are not significantly different. So what they've done is they've looked at these multiple comparisons and they've said, okay, well, some of these don't have a significant difference between them. So they have a large p-value. And so they, in, instead of writing the p-value down in the hypothesis, the way they've chosen to present this data in this paper is by using a superscript. So these small letters here. So anytime you see, so this top one, it's got a tiny e. I can barely read it on this screen. Um, here, so that's an e. That's, oh, that one's got an E there. Um, I think those are the only two. But those two with an E mean that when they look down the table, they both had um, the comparison between those two specimens showed a large P value. And so now we know how what these tests do and roughly what the output looks like. That helps us when we're now trying to interpret what these authors are trying to tell us. And this is an essential skill as a researcher, trying to understand what other people have done and what other people are telling us so that we can build uh, and define our research direction. It is equally an essential skill um, when you so happen to take a statistics module that has an exam at the end. I know I mentioned that word. I'm trying to, t uh, uh, these kind of things are what you're expected to be able to do. So you sh if I was to present you a question with this paper and ask perhaps, could you explain these results? Explain what the table is showing. And you'd be expected to know how to interpret those results. Not necessarily the physical things. I don't expect you to know about um, the details of the dental composites that they're using. You may or may not. But if I've told you that they used ANOVA and Tukey's postdoc test, and you looked at all this labeling, you should be able to work out what, um, how to interpret the numbers, regardless of the context. Anyway, um, now I do want to cover a couple more things I want to cover before we go. So we're running a bit tight on time now. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, how would I report the results in the example? That that very much depends as what I would, what I'd want to do is report what was important. So firstly, so we've done that over, it said there was a difference in the means. We ran the post hoc and maybe we found a difference between, I can't remember what we found here, but maybe we found, a Okay, so we found a difference between all of them except the captain and lieutenant. In which case, that's what I would write in my results. There's a statistically significant difference, p is less than 0 0.05, between all of the group means except for captain and lieutenant, which showed no statistically significant difference. That's how I would report that. So maybe we'll write that down just to make sure that it's been recorded. Um, so, um, so let's say there was or is a statistically significant between the mean weight of all ranks, 
So I want to say P is less than 0 0.05, except um, between um, Is that Lieutenant? Yeah. Now he's challenging my spelling. And then maybe if you wanted to clarify, P is greater than 0 0.05. So if that's what your results showed, that's how I would report that. You may have found when you ran this that there was a statistically significant difference between all of the groups. Um, or you may have found that more than, more than two groups um, were the same. But by looking at the values and then seeing where the differences are, you can actually group them. So you can find in that table, uh, in the table in the paper, they have um, grouped some and basically said that there's no difference between the, the, these ones but these are the ones that stand out and that's important because it's it then directs either what they might propose to do clinically or where they might to the research direction that they might take um, in the future yeah um this is a good question so if you're going to compare the group first of all you have to give the p value of a whole group okay and then if you want to sample one group parametric data so we've really just covered um, parametric tests here but there are equivalent non-parametric tests and so I've just listed them here so uh, for, well, I haven't done this told you which is which so for parametric that covers these are parametric tests and their equivalent ones are these So we've already, last week we did look at the Man whitney u test compared to the T-test. For analysis of variance, there's this thing called the Kruskal-Wallis test. That does exactly the same thing, it just doesn't assume um, normality in the data. And there are multiple ways, as I mentioned earlier, to deal with the multiple comparison issue. But I'm just going to suggest, if you find that you need to do multiple comparisons and you have non-parametric data, Start by applying the Bonferroni correction.
No, Jenny King's the week after. So, um, these tests, the in, in SPSS, you don't need to do this. I'll just show you very, very quickly where they are because I think last time we ended with me doing a very quick example, and it's the same for all of the, all of these non-parametric um, tests, all the cross school Wallace. And so I'll just show you so you at least know where it is and that means it's captured on the on the video so as before it's under the analyze menu and under non-parametric tests once you get used to the way this program is configured things are often not always but often self-explanatory and again we're looking at independent samples or we're assuming that we are and so we click on independent samples and then we can just choose what fields we want to compare. So I want to compare um, weight and I'm going to group them by rank. And when you do that, you can just press run and it tells you the answer. And so it doesn't give you all these confusing tables. It just gives you a simple, sing, single result and it tells you the null hypothesis, the distribution of weight in kilogram is the same across categories of rank. So that's our null hypothesis. It even tells you what its, what its null hypothesis is. It, it's done a cross wallace test. It tells you that it's got a highly significant result and it's telling you that it's going to reject the null hypothesis. So um, there you go, that's, that's where that is. I, well, I, I need to cover, unfortunately, a couple of bits of terminology, and these are things that I particularly, I, these are a pet hate of mine, um, but we need to we need to cover it. So earlier I did mention this term type one error, and you'll see in brackets next to type one error uh, the Greek letter, letter alpha. Now that has already been used as the significance threshold, and this can cause some confusion because it's used interchangeably in uh, to mean two different things but when we're talking about error you have type 1 and type 2 error and they can also be, not be denoted as alpha and beta and I've simply stated what they mean here so the type 1 error is the probability of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis. And we demonstrated that um, earlier. I said that there definitely is a difference between some of the, between all the weight of all of those ranks. I generated that data and made the data up. I know that there is a difference. But in some of the examples, say uh, Lieutenant and Sergeant, we didn't detect that difference in the statistical test, or I didn't. And someone else, I think, maybe captain to sergeant or captain to lieutenant didn't detect the difference, uh, didn't detect that. And so, I was actually, oh, see, this is what I hate, the terminology. That's actually a type two error. That is incorrectly accepting that's finding no difference when there is one. It says it on the slide. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time. I would love to give more time to this. We will cover this, I think, a bit more detail. I'm going to introduce the ideas here, and I think well, I'm going to recap this at the beginning of the next session, because I, I'm itching to go. I've got a meeting to get to, and I suspect that you're itching to go as well. But the point is, there's these terms called type 1 error and type 2 error, and it takes a little bit of thinking about just to make sure you understand what they are, but you do need to understand the meaning of these. And we have this thing called power. You don't, I, I draw these graphs, and sometimes they generate more confusion than they do understanding, so please don't look at it. If it's helpful, look at it. If it's not helpful, ignore it. But just think of it conceptually in this way. We saw that there was a distribution in p-values. We saw that sometimes 
the p value that we got agreed with the true with the truth it agreed that there was differences when there really are differences but sometimes the p value told us that there was no difference when actually there is or sometimes the p value might tell you that there is a difference when there actually isn't type 1 type 2 errors and all the uh, all power does so let's just move on to the definition Hang on. it's the probability of not committing a type 2 error and then you say I do what that's double negatives the question is do we correctly reject the null hypothesis so if we reject the no, we get a p-value that's small and we reject the null hypothesis in our study is that have we how do we know that that's truly representative of what's going on of the thing we're trying to measure and in our multiple experiments when we've got this range of p-values sometimes we rejected the null hypothesis um, incorrectly or we accepted the null hypothesis incorrectly we did both all power is is another probability and it's the probability that we correctly accept the null hypothesis of course uh, see this is what i hate the terminology correctly reject the null hypothesis ignore what i say read what's on the slide um so we if you'd like to give a five minute example you're more than welcome <laughs> but I, So I'm just going to reiterate, I think, <laughs> with power, don't worry too much, but what you just need to recognize is if you, if you repeat an experiment, you won't get the same p-value. Repeat an experiment again, you won't get the same p-value. So what can you do? Well, what do we know? We know that there's some variation in the population that leads to variations in our p-values for different experiments. What can we do? We can increase our sample size. We increase the sample size, we become more confident in the result that we get. And that's basically the message. Bigger sample size and you can get be more confident in the results. In effect, it will have higher power. And a power calculation, what do you need to know to get do a power calculation? You don't need to do it, but you need to know how much variation there is in the population. So how much do things actually vary? Um, you need to know how big the effect is that you want to measure. So how, how, what's this minimally important difference? What's this the smallest thing that you want to be able to measure or smallest change? So what's the smallest change in weight that you'd like to be able to detect for some clinical or practical purpose? And then you ask, well, how many things do I need to measure to be confident that I have detected that, cha that change and that it's representative overall. <laughs> 